So appreciate seeing everyone this afternoon and uh, also your interest in, um, you know, covering the, the extension of the CU series for us. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's exciting. It's a great game. It's a game that we, uh, we all in the state of Colorado care about as it relates to college football. Um, you know, want to thank Rick and, and his staff in Boulder for, you know, the dialogue that's taken place over the last uh, really several months as we've kind of decided what, what rhythm would be appropriate. Um, <clears throat> you know, and we're, we're, we're satisfied. Uh, particularly that we're bringing the games back to campus. Um, you know, I think it was a great run to be down in Denver. Certainly appreciate the relationship that we we both uh, have shared with the Denver Broncos and their willingness to host the game at uh, Mile High Stadium. But it's also great to know that we're we're back on campus and and we've got a, a good rhythm of games ahead of us. Um, you know, next time we play was really a standalone agreement, the 23-24 home and home series. And then we do have a, a four-year uh, break, <clears throat> which, um, you know, I think we we would have preferred to try to get it on that that two-year 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 on two-year off rhythm. But um, the way things had stacked up with what CU had done with their non-conference schedule just didn't make it possible. So we reestablished, you know, the home and home, and then the two-year break. Um, so it was good to get six games pinned in this last agreement, and uh, you know, obviously no financial exchange between the two schools, but. It's great that uh, we found a way to get two Division One FBS programs um, that are, you know, roughly less than an hour apart to to be playing at least at that frequency. Um, I think for CU, you know, not to speak for them too much, but uh, obviously they play nine conference games. We play eight. Uh, just the the limit of uh, one less non-conference game. You know, I think they want to try and exercise, you know, some creativity in those years that they aren't playing us by by sliding in. Um, other opponents that they ordinarily wouldn't see. Um, so, so we're excited. We're fired up. Um, it's good to get that information out and, and to get the agreement signed and look forward to competing in 2023. Hey, Joe, this is Mike Brohard. Does this speak to your scheduling style? I mean, when you look back over the years, you've got 12 games, I believe. You got a home and homes with autonomous five schools, uh, including the four that you've got with Vandy, um, if you go back to the Oregon State games, do you liken this to that? And is that part of your scheduling philosophy? Uh, yeah, sure, Mike. I mean, it, it's a little bit different just because of the history that we share with CU and the proximity and the you know the fact that we're in the same state. Um, so it, it it is a little bit different than those than those other home and homes with autonomous five schools. But as I as I've said before, it's we've. Uh, <clears throat> You know, as we as we look for those opportunities, typically a, an autonomous five that's got a stadium of less than sixty thousand is is oftentimes willing to to sign up for a home and home, uh, just because you know it's not as advantageous for them to to kind of buy those non conference games. If you get a stadium that's sixty or more, certainly eighty or more, you know they're they're never going to give a game. Um, if you remember the way that we end up with the Arkansas game, that was just by fluke, and so that. We'll never see an SEC opponent with a stadium over 80,000 here again, um, at least in a home at home, maybe a two for one. Is that something you're still trying to do? And is there a possibility you can get other home and homes with autonomous fives? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've, we've put a lot of focus in right now to, to getting guaranteed games on the schedule. Uh, we've got uh, another one to announce, uh, not quite finalized, but but we'll have a, another autonomous five guarantee game. Um, uh, so that's up and coming. And, and then we'll start our focus on trying to build the schedule out beyond 2026. Um, you, you know, so we're, we're getting close to being done in those years, but it's remarkable how fast things fill up right now. Um, you know, there's just been, a, a, I think, a, a big shift across the country with people trying to lock in their non-conference opponents much earlier. Is that an announcement a home and home or is it just a one? It, it'll be a guarantee game. It'll be another okay. guarantee game. Yeah. Hey, Joe, uh, you, you just touched on it. You know, scheduling seems to be extending out further and further. 
just why is that? Is it ever kind of weird to be looking at, you know, talking games in late twenties or, you know, even early thirties and, and things like that. Just how, how kind of odd is it putting these together and knowing, you know, the landscape of college football obviously can, can change a lot over that course of time. Yeah, Kevin, it, it, it has been strange and it's probably been the last three years that there's been a real shift towards trying to accelerate your schedule and getting games on the calendar uh, way in advance. You know, and I think as soon as a, a group of schools kind of breaks in that direction, it's, it forces everyone else to try and, you know, follow and kind of keep up. Um, there's a, I don't know if you guys are aware, but there's a, a really great scheduling tool and resource called Gridiron. Um, the fellow that operates that consulting group is Dave Brown. He used to be the primary scheduler for ESPN for, for uh, uh, probably almost two full decades. And then he shifted over to be the president of Longhorn Network um, and, and is no longer with ESPN, but he decided to create a resource for college football scheduling and, and uh, known Dave for a long, long time. And he's, uh, he's a wonderful resource for all of us in Division I football. And uh, I mean, he's a savant. I mean, he, he carries, you know, literally every FBS schedule around in his head and, and knows um, you know, the, the, the space really well and has uh, been really beneficial in, in helping schools, particularly late, you know, if you're, if you, you know, if you're trying to get a couple games in, in the next season or two, you know, he knows all the moves management that needs to take place to kind of manufacture opportunities that really don't exist. And Dave's been a resource for us. I know he's been a resource for CU, um, you know, really is a resource for all, all of F FBS football. Then just talking this CU series specifically, was it always, um, I guess, a even discussions, you know, about, you know, three home, three home for each team, or, or did you guys have to work to make sure that happened? And how important is that to make sure, I guess, it's equitable in, in CU coming here, especially since you lost, yeah. you know, this year's game? Yeah, it, um, yes. I mean, there was never a conversation about, you know, not being a home and home format. You know, there was never any, um, you know, discussion on CU's part about, you know, we need two for one opportunities to, to make this happen. Um, early on, when I say early on, probably my first uh, three years here at CSU, you know, I was always asking Rick for the opportunity to play each year, um, you know, and then I, you know, he made it clear based on just their, their one less non-conference game that they felt more comfortable establishing a, a two on two off rhythm. Um, you know, so, so happy to be where we're at. Uh, with the series and and uh, you yeah, know there was really no discussion of other than home and home games and there you know the disruption that occurred this last year with the 2020 season you know there wasn't even any conversation about how do we you know on our part you know we we weren't really interested in trying to put an additional home game on our schedule because if you remember within the original agreement which I think was an 11 year uh, 10 neutral site games the, the one in Fort Collins we were supposed to provide a guarantee of a million dollars to CU. And, and uh, so, you know, that was the, the one, um, you know, positive, if, the, if there was a positive out of, you know, losing the game is that, you know, we didn't have to fulfill that commitment to CU. So if we asked, I think, for an opportunity to play them um, in Fort Collins without an offsetting game in Boulder, I'm sure Rick wouldn't, uh, wouldn't let us overlook that one piece of financial commitment on, on our part to them. Hey, Joe, Eddie with the Reporter Herald. Um, I'm curious, I just saw starting with that 2029 game, the visiting team gets like 2,700 tickets to distribute. Will it be the same for those 2023, 2024 games as well there? Uh, Eddie, I can't recall what's in the agreement for that for that game. I, I can look up or, and let Kyle, you know, I'll, I'll check into it, let Kyle clarify that for you. No worries, just curious about that. Thank you, though. Yep. Hey, Joe, just a couple big picture questions for you while we have you here. Um, you spoke about maybe a silver lining there, not having to give up that $1 million, uh, for the CU game. In terms of your financial health through the pandemic, in the broad, broad sense, where does the athletics department stand? And when you project having fans back in the stadium and just getting a little bit of normalcy, you know, how quickly do you think you can make up uh, some of those losses that you incurred this year? Yeah, you know, I, I think the losses that we incurred this year are, are, you know, 
fortunately will be focused into this year. You know, we've, we've got a, a financial plan that will allow us to, to meet the budget that we established for FY21. Uh, we, did, we did lose roughly $18 million in self-generated revenues. Almost 16 million of those are, would have been football associated. Um, but, <clears throat> but we run two different financial organizations. I think we've kind of reviewed that with this group before. One that is uh, really department operations, the, the other is Canvas Stadium itself. And uh, the systems office here at CSU uh, worked on, um, in, in, in partnership with campus and, and President McConnell, uh, a scoop and toss, which took really the biggest chunk of the, the expenses associated with Canvas Stadium's operating budget, which was debt service. And they moved that out into future years. So that created uh, a big, um, a lot more flexibility than we would have had. Um, and, and they applied that scoop and toss uh, for three years. So if needed, we, we'd be able to have a reduced debt service in uh, this year, FY22 and FY23. So that's why, you know, it's not like we've incurred a deficit that has to be addressed with, you know, central administration. Um, and we just really knuckled down on our operating expenses. I saw that that Rick had made a comment that, that he um, required his approval, executive staff approval for expenditures of a thousand or more. We did it for, I think it was $200 or more. So we, we really made it clear to all of our programs that you know, financial management and, and living really in an austere environment was very, very important this year. So we're gonna finish within budget and um, and uh, you know, excited for that. And our, our goal was was to limit any of the impacts just to this year. Now, FY22 is a new year. It, it will be important for us to get as close to normalized operations as possible. We're um, you know we're we're planning right now for you know full occupancy of all of our venues. We'll we'll see uh, if there's any restrictions that are required. But you know the the news that we're seeing the the epidemiological. Um, modeling that, that the university has been following, you know, shows things getting really, really good June, July, and hopefully beyond that, um, you know, we're, we're right now, you know, filling the venue um, with season ticket sales and individual game sales and, and many plans without any uh, plan of physically distancing in the stadium. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about making an accommodation for is, you know, maybe identifying a couple sections that would be physically distant. So if there's people that have higher levels of concern that feel like they want that uh, type of reassurance, then they can kind of self-select to go to those areas. But vaccines getting widely distributed. I think people in the state of Colorado are taking advantage of that. Uh, hopefully, hopefully when each of our numbers called, we do. Um, you know, the closer we can get to herd immunity, the more that we can go back to normalized operations. And that's that's been our plan. And, and uh, hopefully, hopefully it it, uh, it advances that way. The uh, economic impact also goes to the fans too, though, right? Season ticket holders. I'm yeah. wondering with retention, where are you guys at with that? Or do you have as much interest as you would pre-pandemic in, in season tickets for football? Uh, yeah, I, I think we do. You know, if, if you recall, we did, um, you know, we reached out to every one of our season ticket holders that had subscribed to, to a ticket package in 2020, and we offered them the opportunity to convert that commitment into 100% cash, cash donations. Some people did that. Uh, we also told them they could keep it in a basically a ticket bank for future use. The vast majority of people chose to elect that option. So a lot of our renewals are based on people just simply taking money that would have been um, spent in 2020 that we already had in hand and applying that to their 2021 ticket packages, whether it was you know, for any of our season ticketed sports, men and women's basketball, volleyball, or football. Uh, so, so that money's in place and has been in place for a while. It will accrue to the 2022 year when the tickets are actually used. So even though, you know, we've had them in a, you know, in an account for athletics here for basically in some cases longer than a year, it'll, it'll be applied to the 2022 budget. Gotcha. And just one final quick one from me. It's been such a weird year with COVID, building relationships with coaches, um, you know, at CSU. How would you describe your relationship with Steve Adazio, given all the strangeness of this past season? Um, and what has given you kind of increased confidence that, you know, that he is the guy to really build this thing? Yeah, it, you know, it, it, 
the fall was absolutely an abbreviated, you know, football season for sure. You know, we'd scheduled eight games, got only four in, um, you know, really three of the four had no, you know, was no causation by us. Uh, what gives me confidence? I mean, I, Steve and I, you know, we, we established a rhythm of week, meeting weekly. Um, every Tuesday we would huddle up uh, for a, a, a team's call. Um, we have had occasions to be together in the same room as well. I traveled with football every game this year. Um, obviously, it was on the sideline for the one one game that we did host in Canvas Stadium. So, um, you know, then you pick up all the, the, the just one-off conversations that have accrued. And I'd say my points of contact with Steve have been similar to any other time, even in normalized operations, just less face-to-face. Um, got a strong relationship, um, you know, a, a trusting relationship. And, uh, you know, what I've, what I've really appreciated about Coach Adazio is that his attentiveness to, to culture has been um, second to none. I mean, that's really been his focus as a head coach is to monitor every aspect of the program and think through, you know, the impacts of every kind of little, um, you know, the, the ripple effects of every decision across the entire program. And I think he's got a committed staff that's really focused on the vision that he's creating for CSU football. They got in 15 full spring practices and, and got a ton of great work in. Um, so, you know, very confident in, in the culture, the foundation that he's laid for the program. And, um, you know, for him, you know, you, you've listened to him enough. It, it begins in the trenches with line play and, and then the pieces after that. So, He's just kind of a, a hard nose focused on, you know, playing tough football. It's a, it's an aggressive sport. And, and I think he's, he's got the right approach to, to build a, a program that is all about toughness. Hey, Joe, I just had a quick uh, kind of follow up on attendance. Obviously, you know, this year's CSU freshmen haven't been able to attend any games, obviously incoming freshmen next year uh, won't have just how important will it be to, connect with that student base and, you know, kind of start, I don't, I don't know if rebuilding is the right word, but, you know, so many kids haven't had a chance to see CSU athletics. How important is it to connect with them? Yeah. I mean, I think your, your communication and connectivity with that group, with those two classes that you're right, have not stepped foot into either Moby arena or canvas stadium is going to be really, really important to, you know, establishing the relationship with the student body. We've talked a lot about that. We've we self-diagnosed that months ago and and have been, you know, giving thought to, to what we do when they get back and even beforehand, you know, what level of communication takes place with that group um, through the season. And, and we've, you know, had the right dialogue, I think, uh, across campus outside of athletics about, you know, really trying to use athletics as a leverage point to, to bringing the campus community back together. Um, you know, students are, are really the stakeholder group that creates the atmosphere in every one of our venues. So it's going to be important to get them back. And Kevin, I, you know, I'm hopeful that they're eager and hungry to be a part of it as well. You know, I mean, I think everyone has been worn out by the, the, you know, the requirements of COVID to kind of stay distanced and, and limit your contact with others. And so when we're, uh, at the point that we can in, invite the community back together, I hope there's an overwhelming response. You know, we, we reserve in the case of football, 10,500 seats for students. And, uh, you know, if there's no restrictions, I, I hope that we, you know, get in a situation where we've got to, we've got to disappoint some students that would rather be in stadium that we can't accommodate. Hey, Joe, this is Mike. Just uh, looking at the uh, guarantee games. I think you've got four right now on the schedule. There's a fifth one that you hinted at would fill up. If you look at the next six years, you're playing autonomous five schools at least twice every year, three times in 2026. Is that important to you? Not just to, to give it to the fans, but to give the fans experience to travel to some of these places like Michigan and Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the intent of creating those opportunities, not, you know, kind of multifaceted, certainly, for our team, just to, to measure where we're at as a program uh, by playing those tough opponents. Um, you know, we've consistently talked about those games being the games that our students will remember for their entire lives. So it's it's going to be wonderful for those teams to say that they played in Austin, Texas at DKR Memorial Stadium, you know, to walk into Michigan Stadium through a singular tunnel that accommodates both teams is a pretty special experience. I was eight years there as a staff member and 
four years as a student and had been on that field a number of times and it's a pretty special environment. So that's great for our students to be able to experience that. Same in Iowa. I mean, they've got a really energized fan base and, and some neat traditions. So I think it'll be great for our fans and our students to experience that. You know, we, we, we do all these things in partnership with the Alumni Association. So, you know, our, our, our fan base typically, you know, circles one game. They, you know, I, I don't see great turnouts at our conference schedule for the, the road games typically, but, but certainly, you know, I think we, we have autonomous five showings when we, when we go to Florida and, and Arkansas and, and have those opportunities to play on the road. So I would expect those games to be uh, highly attended by, by CSU Rams and, and a great experience for everyone. I'm good. Anything else for Joe? Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, you Thanks, bet. sir. Justin, nothing from you? Come on. <laughs> He's not really there. There he is. I was going to go before Mike, but I'm sorry. Hey, Joe, have you had a chance to just reflect back on what this process was like for you as the athletic director over the pandemic, how crazy it all was? Or, you know, are, are you not really in that mode yet? Uh, I do a lot of self-assessment. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's been, you know, probably not daily, but there's been a lot of, you know, reflection on, on where we're at. And, you know, my, my goal from the very onset was, you know, to, to limit whatever, you know, impacts to just one year. And, and I think from a financial perspective, you know, hopefully that will be the case for us. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll plan for whatever's ahead. Um, you know, I, I think we've done really as good a job as anyone in the nation, you know, managing and protecting the health and safety of our student athletes. Um, Terry DeZeo, who I've talked about a lot um, publicly, I think is, is one of the foremost authorities in sports medicine in our country. And we're fortunate to have him on our staff and, and he's really worked to create a, a best in practice approach to, to, you know, managing COVID with great partnerships. You know, we've got you know, we've got the, the PPT, which is a pandemic preparedness team. That's a, you know, resource on campus that makes all the, ultimately all the decisions related to COVID. And we interface with them routinely each week. And then whenever is necessary, um, you know, the health partnerships that we have in the community have really been beneficial to us with UC Health being one of our primary testing partners throughout the year. You know, football, we, we did it at a conference level with Quest and uh, you know, for all of our other programs, once we transitioned into into uh, you know preparation for the spring semester and spring semester, it's been it's been either UC Health or Campus Resources. About November, I think it was, uh, the research enterprise here at CSU perfected uh, a saliva test for COVID that's being used to surveil all students, not just student athletes. So, you know, we we've we've got you know great resources that have been applied to this and, and you know also have to give credit to our students you know they, they've responded and you know the one thing that we did differently than anyone else as far as I can tell you, you all may have done some research on it but I think we were the only school in the nation that kind of flipped the decision and made students opt in for participation as opposed to opt out I think that was a creative way to to really move forward with kids that felt very comfortable with what we were doing we had over 97% of our students in the fall and the spring that elected to opt in to team activities. Um, so, you know, we tried to be really thoughtful and, and manage this in a, in a way that gave a lot of control back to our students and, and, and uh, tried to get them the best information to make informed decisions. You know, obviously the scheduling landscape, it's ever changing. You've already, you know, got talked about that a little bit, but are things starting to feel a little bit no more just normal on your end? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I do. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, and I, and I think what we've learned is going to help us normalize even more, right? I mean, we, we've devoted a lot of effort at cleaning protocols. And then, you know, the CDC last week and this week, you know, has, has come out and said that, you know, from the research that they've done, you know, that that's probably not a, a, a typical method of transmission for COVID-19. So it's just, you know, once that kind of filters through, you know, the resocialization of sport document that the NCAA created once that gets implemented, you know, through the PPT on campus, you know, what a relief that will be to, you know, that our custodial staffs and, and others don't have to, you know, do these intensive cleaning processes to, to, you know, 
um, you know, ready a, a space for, for use. You know, right now our softball team plays and I think every, every third inning, you know, they clean the balls, you know, that was part of the resocialization of sport documentation and basketball, we did the same thing. Volleyball, we did the same thing. Well, you know, if hard surfaces aren't the, the, the likely transmission of COVID-19, you know, that, that hopefully won't be a requirement any longer and we can kind of step away and, and that allows us to, you know, normalize activities and, and devote resources to other things other than the management of, of COVID through, you know, excessive cleaning exercises. How quickly can those type of things change? Does it, you know, take, you know, a couple of weeks after these type of announcements from the CDC? Oh, Justin, I don't know. You know, I, I think it's going to be probably longer than a couple of weeks. You know, I think it, it takes a little bit of time to affirm that research and then for it to work through. But, you know, we've already tried to prompt the conversations. I talked to Terry, who sits, you know, yesterday, actually the last couple of days, we've had conversations about it. He sits on some national boards that have influence, um, you know, with the NCAA and, and Brian Hainline, who's the chief medical officer with the NCAA. So, you know, we, you start the conversations and, and you allow them to occur at a comfortable pace. You know, all these decisions are ultimately going to be made by medical uh, experts and, and people in that field. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with um, one of the people at Lead One, which is the ADs, you know, our, our national organization and, and prompted that thought with them. Um, so they were going to, you know, use their points of contact with the NCAA and Brian Hainline's group to start that conversation. But each of these things, you know, it's going to take a while to unwind the bureaucracy that we've established in the last year to help us manage this. But I think we'll get to that point. Thanks, Joe. Anything else? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Thanks, right. Joe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. Appreciate it.